The following message was recorded at an event hosted by Desiring God. More information about Desiring God events, conferences, and resources is available at www.desiringgod.org. I would like to thank you for the welcome which John Piper gave me in your name. He was absolutely right when he said that I'm here because I am concerned about the state of the church and I am here because I know no greater privilege in any of the things that I do in the course of my ministry than seeking one way or another to encourage pastors. I think of myself as a pastor. I tell folk when they ask me that I've had a double calling from the Lord. First I was called to be a Christian and then I was called to be a pastor. And such teaching as I've done in various places and such writing as has come out of that, I see as specific ways of fulfilling my pastoral ministry. So when I have the opportunity of ministering to pastors, I feel that I'm coming home. And I rejoice in this opportunity of fellowship with you folk here in this conference. And it's going to be my joy to share with you on the subjects which you've set me. And it was that way round. I am speaking on what I was asked to speak about. And tonight's topic, as you know, is the source of faith. And without more ado, I would like to lead you into it. This is going to be a topical address. A good deal of scripture will come into it. But it isn't strictly a sermon. By sermon, I understand the taking of a text and seeking to make it talk and deliver its own message through you, its agent. I'm not quite doing that. But I do want to put what, what I'm going to say to you under the authority of the written word. And therefore, I would like to read scripture to you before I begin to speak on my own account. So turn with me, if you will, to the passage from which the overall title of our conference comes. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2. And I'm going to read the first ten verses. Paul writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not from yourselves. It's the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's a marvelous statement of the truth about the saving grace of God. May it be blessed to our hearts. May it bring joy to us, encouragement, and may God give us insight into the implications of all that Paul is saying here. My title is The Source of Faith. 
And that title takes us right back to basics. Faith is a New Testament keyword, just as grace is a New Testament keyword. The New Testament is developing a vocabulary of what we would call technical terms to deal with the things that are really central to the gospel. Grace and faith are two of the words which have been picked up from the Greek language, given a quite new sense and significance, defined in a very precise way and used as technical terms by the New Testament writers. Faith is a very vital term because it points to the salvation of sinners, bad and guilty people for whom God prepared a salvation which faith lays hold of. Grace also is a vital term for there would be no laying hold of this salvation apart from grace. Just as without grace there would have been no salvation won on the cross, so without grace there would be no salvation seen, trusted, and received. That we're going to see tonight before we're through. So were it not for grace and faith, there simply would not be any Christians. You and I would not be believers tonight, and neither would anyone else. It's important then that we understand grace and faith. Otherwise we hardly know who or what we are. And certainly as pastors we're scarcely qualified to preach the gospel and minister to others. We pastors, as surely we all of us have found over and over again in our own experience, are constantly being exposed to the temptation to preach and teach not grace and faith, God saving sinners, but religion, sinners working to save themselves. We are tempted, in other words, to lapse from preaching the gospel to the kind of preaching which marked the ministry of John Wesley for nearly 20 years before he came to understand the gospel. He preached religion. And eventually a Moravian friend told him, in words which deserve memorizing, preach faith, he said, until you have it, and when you have it, then you will certainly preach it. (laughs) Well, he, he took that advice, and he was preaching faith as best he could before he came into the assurance of faith himself. And then for 50 more years of magnificent ministry, he preached faith up and down the length and breadth of Britain, as you know, and was marvelously used by God in doing it. As we are constantly tempted to fall back into preaching religion, so are people who listen to us are constantly tempted to mishear what we say as if we were preaching religion. The natural man turns the message of grace and faith into a message for his own heart about religion. And we tell him to believe and he goes off and tries to do. He doesn't get the message. It takes, as I shall be saying over and over before and through, the power of the Holy Spirit illuminating to teach folk, as the hymn says, to cast their deadly doing down and enter into God's salvation by grace through faith. And this is, of course, no new problem. It was the problem when Jesus himself was preaching the gospel in Palestine and he pinpointed it on one occasion when he said to the Pharisees that the tax collectors and the street women go into the kingdom before you do. Why is that? Because you, you Pharisees, You are engaged in religion. And you're so concerned with doing things to commend yourself to God, so concerned to work for your salvation and to practice religion, 
that you never stop to face the depth of your own real spiritual need, nor the inadequacy of the things that you're doing, and so the things that Jesus was preaching could not get through to those Pharisees. You see, no one enters into the reality of salvation by grace, through faith, until they know themselves as lost sinners. And the Pharisees did not know themselves as lost sinners, and nothing that Jesus could say to them, whether he spoke gently as he did sometimes, or whether he spoke cuttingly as he did at other times, would get through to them at that point. And in our congregations there are folk who present us with equal difficulty of communication. We cannot get through to them about their lostness, so we cannot get through to them with the message of grace and faith. We ourselves, I trust, can say, indeed sing from the heart with John Newton, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I trust we all of us would be found giving our testimony very much in those words. I was a lost sinner and Jesus found me. Uh, I was converted at age 18, but I had two years of thoroughgoing Phariseeism before the Lord showed me that I was a lost sinner. And it may be that some of you had a similar experience. You don't know that you're a sinner until you have faced God's holiness. And it's only God himself who will bring you to the point of facing his holiness. We're back where we were five minutes ago. It's through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through the ministry of the Lord himself in human lives, that conversions result, that people come out of darkness into light, and folk are saved by grace through faith. And as I speak tonight quite specifically about faith, as I've been asked to do, I shall try not to forget that, and I shall try to make the connection at every point where the connection needs to be made. And perhaps you will feel, when I've finished my message, that it was more a message about the Holy Spirit than it was about faith. I don't mind if that's the conclusion you come to. Because really that's my strategy. It has to be. That's how the Bible forces you to square up to a subject like this. Faith is not a human work. Faith is not an ingredient in man-made religion. Faith is a gift of God. Faith is the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. And everything that I say, if it's said right, must underline that. And if I say anything which sounds as if I've forgotten that, well, I tell you now, uh, I shall be speaking wrong and you must forget my mistakes. All right? Now, tomorrow morning I shall be talking in detail about the analysis of what faith is. And tonight I shall only give you a provisional definition, just a few phrases which I throw at you without very much explanation. But we must have a provisional definition, otherwise we shan't be able to get into our subject with any clarity at all. So let me say, faith is conscious response to grace. And here let me say, just as Christianity is Christ, so grace, in the final analysis, is Christ. Oh, I know that grace is more than Christ, but grace focuses in Christ, and the grace which evokes faith is Christ, most precisely, most specifically. Just think of John chapter 20. First Easter Sunday evening. There are the disciples huddled behind locked doors, for fear of the Jews. The Jews had recently disposed of their master. Now the disciples are terrified that the Jews will be after them. They are men in a state of inner panic, men without any hope or prospects, men who can think of nothing better to do with the rest of their lives than to keep out of sight. 
men then in need in their, pres in their immediate situation, and men who were carrying with them quite certainly a deep sense of guilt because of the way in which they'd all of them undertaken to stand by their master whatever happened. And then, having given that undertaking, they'd all of them forsaken him and fled, and Peter, in particular, had denied him in a most spectacular way, as we know. Well, through the locked doors comes Jesus. Stood in the midst, says the text, John 20, verse 19 it is, and said to them, not words of recrimination, not words of censure, but words of mercy. Peace be with you, he said. And though, of course, as we know, that was as casual, or in other contexts, was as casual a way of greeting someone whom you knew as our wave of the hand and saying hi is at this present time, 1988 in North America. On Jesus' lips at that time, those words were very, very far from being a casual greeting. John points it out by the next detail in his story. When he said this, says John, he showed them his hands and his side. Not, I think, for purposes of identification, because they knew already who he was, but to remind them of what he had suffered in winning for them the peace peace with God, the peace of forgiveness, the peace of acceptance, the peace of knowing that God's hand is on you, the peace of knowing then that you can face the future boldly because the Lord is with you. Jesus is showing them what he had suffered, reminding them of what he had suffered to win for them that peace which he was now bringing them. And when he said, peace be with you, that was his word of blessing as he brought them the peace that he died to secure on their behalf. And that's grace. My one-sentence definition of grace these days is Jesus coming into human lives, into lives that are hurting and lives that are scared and lives that are guilty and lives that are lost to bring peace. And faith is a response to precisely that grace, the living Lord who comes offering peace. Uh, John, in that same 20th chapter of his Gospel, tells how Thomas, who wasn't there the first time Jesus appeared, was actually, in mercy, given a repeat experience of that. That, 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 that meeting, I mean, between Jesus and the disciples a week later. And John narrates how the effect of this was to bring Thomas to faith. And he said, my Lord and my God, and I guess that he was on his knees as he said it. And that was faith. Faith is a response to grace. In wonder, loss, with trembling joy we take the pardon of our God. Pardon for sins of deepest dye, pardon secured by Jesus' blood, who is a pardoning God like thee and who has grace so rich and free. That's the precious verse of Samuel Davis' hymn, which for some reason I can't conceive what it was, was left out in the version that we sang just now. One in wonder lost with trembling joy we take the pardon of our God. Those words shouldn't really have been left out, brothers, now should they? But there it is. I've filled them in now. <laughs> and that's the grace to which faith is a response. So faith involves recognition of one's need and of Christ's mercy extended to meet that need. Faith involves realization that the Lord is personally addressing you. Faith involves your response of relying on Jesus Christ, his person to be your mediator, his work to secure your peace, 
peace with God for time and fraternity. Faith means what the acronym that we teach in the Sunday school says, F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all I take him. And faith then becomes the root from which springs the fruit of heartfelt worship and wholehearted obedience. Let that do as a definition of faith for the time being. That, I think, is sufficient to make vivid to our minds what it is that we're talking about. I have been asked to explore with you the source of faith. And this I now move into. Says someone, I don't know what the problem is. Why should you prepare to spend uh, two-thirds of a whole address talking about the source of faith. Isn't it obvious? Faith comes from the heart. Faith is a, an act of the will. Faith is human decision. One says that. What more need be said? Well, of course, that's true as far as it goes, but there is something more that needs to be said. There is more to faith and the source of faith than just saying that. Because one has to raise the further question, how does it happen? How does it come about that a person from the heart makes this decision and commitment? I appeal to you as converted persons. What does your heart say to you in answer to that question? If your heart says, well... There came a day when I thought it would be a good idea to take the Jesus trip, so I took it. I would seriously wonder whether you were a real believer at all. I think there are a lot of people in our churches who couldn't say more than that. But then I think we do well to wonder whether they're Christians, because the heart of a truly converted, truly regenerate, truly born-again person does not speak in those terms at all. What a truly converted heart says, I say this, I don't think any of you are going to contradict it, is, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Who did it? Lord, you did it. I didn't do it. I made a decision, sure, I made a commitment, that's true. I moved out of sin into a new life. But that was because you moved me. It was grace that brought forth faith. That, I believe, is the spontaneous testimony of every Christian heart. Now, let's dig into this and try to understand it properly. Let me spend a little time speaking to the human problem, the problem, I mean, of the human heart, as it's presented to us, first by the Lord Jesus himself, and then by the Apostle Paul. It's the problem which theologians have sometimes labeled with the word inability. The problem of being, our being morally and spiritually unable, as we are, to receive and respond to the gospel message. You could call it, in a term which other theologians have used in this century, perversity. Because it isn't a kind, it isn't a physical inability. A physical inability is not something for which a person can be held guilty. The fact that I can't jump six feet into the air in the way that some athletes can is not a morally reprehensible thing. At least I don't think so, and I hope that you don't think so either. Um, but this is not a physical inability, it's a moral inability. That's why perversity is actually a better name for it, I think. It's a perversity that we indulge. It's an inability which we cherish. It's an unwillingness to turn to God, which is very much part of us. That's our fallenness. But it's also a part of ourselves which we cherish and which we like, or putting it in other terms still, 
we don't want to turn to God and that's why we don't that's the natural state of fallen man set in the mold spiritually speaking of the first sin of Adam our first father from whom this twist of our spiritual nature is inherited in the final analysis the New Testament has different ways of expressing the thought that we haven't got it in us by nature to respond positively to the call of God neither to his law nor to his gospel the New Testament talks as we shall see in a minute about our being blind and about our being dead two pictures of incomprehension and unresponsiveness uh, but see this first as Jesus states it I turn you for a moment to John's Gospel chapter 3 and the beginning of Jesus famous conversation with the Pharisee Nicodemus you remember how it went by night says John and I'm sure he had a little grin on his face as he wrote those words because of course this is a perfect example of the double meaning that John likes to put into his phrases it was by night literally and uh, in the sense that the sun had gone down and the streets were dark it was also night spiritually and John wants us to understand that it was night in that second sense as well as in the first sense Nicodemus came in spiritual darkness but he comes as a senior man he is a Pharisee he's a ruler of the Jews that is a member of the Sanhedrin he probably is twice the age of this young preacher from the country Jesus and so naturally as the older man he expects to open the conversation and in fact he does uh, he says um, rabbi now that's honorific uh, he's being very polite and affirmative towards Jesus uh, rabbi teacher he says to him we know who's the we well it's uh, Nicodemus and his fellow Pharisaic theologians the Jew members of the Jerusalem Theological Society as we might call them uh, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God we know that because no one could perform the, mir the miracles the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him uh, it's Nicodemus saying to Jesus of course being here in the big city having just come up from the country you are wondering what we think about you you're feeling a bit uncertain of yourself uh, you're feeling a bit of an outsider I, I, we, I want you to know says Nicodemus that we would love to have you as a member of the Jerusalem Theological Society I've come on behalf of my friends and colleagues to invite you in please come to our meetings and uh, share your views with ours and he thinks that he's paying Jesus a great compliment what he's actually doing of course as you can see is patronizing the Son of God and in light of that fact in light of that fact you can't wonder that Jesus response to him isn't uh, a grateful appreciation of Nicodemus courteous words but an utterance which strikes a completely new note and knocks Nicodemus off balance he doesn't know what to make of it the young man whom he's just called rabbi looks at him and instead of uh, as I said the sort of response that Nicodemus expected he simply says truly I tell you no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again Nicodemus as I said is thrown he doesn't understand he stumbles he fumbles how can a man be born again when he's old Nicodemus asks surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born uh, probably the words when he's old are Nicodemus talking about Nicodemus I'm supposing that as Jesus was about 30 so Nicodemus was about 60 I'm an old man he says what do you mean you asking me to enter a second time into my mother's womb and be born sorry rabbi I have the foggiest idea what you're talking about and perhaps he frowned a little feeling that Jesus words had been very much less than courteous Jesus response is to repeat in fuller form what he said already 
I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, you hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. In relation to folk who are not yet born of the Spirit, everyone who is born of the Spirit is mysterious, inexplicable. You know that something is going on in their lives, but you can't understand it because you yourself are outside it. Just as when the wind blows, you can see plenty of evidence that it's blowing. You see the branches fallen under the trees. You see the, the leaves whirling around in the streets. But you don't know where the winds come from. You can't tell where it's going. The wind is beyond your understanding. And so is the born-again Christian, says Jesus to Nicodemus. Well, you can see what he's doing. He's confronting Nicodemus with the reality of what we called a moment ago human inability. He's saying, no one can see the kingdom of God, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. When he speaks of being born of water and the Spirit, by the way, let me tell you what uh, I think those words mean. I am persuaded that all exegeses which oppose the water to the Spirit are on the wrong track because if Jesus had meant that, here's a point of Greek grammar which is actually weighty, if you know Greek you'll pick it up straight away, uh, the article would have needed to be repeated um, if it was one birth of water and another birth of the Spirit. well, the article before the, would have needed to be repeated before the second noun, and it isn't. Uh, so I think that what is happening here is most certainly that Jesus is talking about a single renewing blood, which has two sides to it, one pictured by water, the other pictured by the Spirit. I am confirmed in thinking that by the fact that very shortly Jesus rebukes Nicodemus for not understanding He says, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? What that means, surely, is that Nicodemus, as an an Old Testament scholar, teacher of Israel in in the, the law of God, you see, should have understood it because it's there in the Old Testament all the time. So one looks into the Old Testament and indeed it is there. It's there in Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 25 through 27 where God is predicting what he will do in the day when he sets up his kingdom among his people and he makes the prediction through Ezekiel in these terms Ezekiel 36, 25 I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols there's the water I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit in you. And you will, and and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Water, spirit. That, I think, is what lies behind Jesus' phrase. And he expected Nicodemus to be able to pick it up and it was to Nicodemus' shame that as an Old Testament student he couldn't pick it up. Well, we mustn't take it further. Suffice it to say that here, as clearly as can be, you've got Jesus pointing to inability. Inability to enter the kingdom of God, which is the realm of salvation, the new relationship with God, which means life, it's the relation of faith and Uh, faith and submission to God faith and repentance as we would call it then you're under God as your king that means you're in the kingdom and that's eternal life but says Jesus no one sees the kingdom no one perceives it intellectually and certainly no one enters the kingdom by taking the action that brings you in without being born again God has got to renew a person inwardly if ever they are to see and enter the kingdom of God. 
So says Jesus in, in John chapter 3. Now turn on to John chapter 6, where you've got parallel teaching given, this time to the hungry crowd, the 5,000, or a good section of the 5,000, whom Jesus had fed miraculously the day before. Now they followed him across the lake, and they are asking him, in that uh, roundabout but meaning way, which is characteristic of the East, to give, him, give them some more free meals. And that's the point of uh, verse 30. Uh, what miraculous sign will you give us that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Uh, they are dropping a very broad hint, you see, that they want some more free food. And Jesus has just said to them, um, in answer to their question, uh, well, you have to go right back to the beginning of the story. Um, Jesus said to them, verse 26, if you've got your Bibles open, you can see it. I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw the, you, you saw the meal I gave you as a sign of who I am and of the spiritual life that I bring. You're with me because you ate the loaves and had your fill, and I know your hearts. You know, now you want some more. And he says, verse 27, Don't work for food that spoils. Work for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Uh, they string along with what he said. They ask, verse 28, What must we do then to do the works God requires? Jesus says, the work of God is this, believe in the one whom he sent. Hence, this, um, this reaction, they, they don't want to pick up on that. Uh, they want to go back, and they do go back to their original thought, please give us another free meal. And Jesus says, um, look at it, verse 32, I tell you the truth, it wasn't Moses who gave you bread from heaven, it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's trying, as you can see, to make them focus on himself and put their faith in him. But they aren't getting the message. Sir, they say, verse 34, from now on give us this bread. And now, well... John gives us uh, a flow of utterance from the Lord Jesus. I, I, I think there are some uh, gaps in it which um, I shall fill as I read it. I don't think that I'm twisting the sense. I think I'm bringing it out. Uh, follow through with me and come to your own opinion about it. Jesus, verse 35, declares, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Pause. He looks at them. Their faces are still rather glum. This isn't what they've come for. So he says to them, verse 36, But I told you, uh, you've seen me, and still you don't believe. And then another pause. And now he says something which is both information for him and encouragement, sorry, information for them and encouragement, I think, to himself. It's what he wants to say in order to remind himself of the purpose of God for which, for which he came and which is certainly going to be fulfilled. All that the Father gives me, he says, verse 37, will come to me, and whoever comes to me, the Greek actually says, whoever is in process of coming to me, I will never drive away. That's a word of marvelous <laughs> encouragement for folk who are laboring as they seek to find their way to Christ and his cross. And then he says, For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of what he's given me, but raise it up at the last day. The Jews hear him say these things, and they begin to grumble, verse 41. They grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They grumble first because he isn't giving them the further free meal that they'd hoped for. 
but they're grumbling now because he's saying things that they don't understand and instead of realizing that the fault is in them they grumble at Jesus for saying something which still leaves them puzzled as if it was an insult to them for him to do that and they say isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph whose father and mother we know how can he now say I came down from heaven he's being offensive and they are offended that's as far as they get in response to Jesus words and now I've, I've, I've go, run through all this so that you'll see the real force of what is said in the next two verses where Jesus responds to their grumbling stop grumbling among yourselves Jesus answered no one can come to me there's that inability again no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draw him and I will raise him up this, that is I will raise up the one who comes at the last day it's written in the prophets they'll all be taught of God quote from Isaiah everyone who listens to the father and learns from him comes to me do you see what's happening once again Jesus is testifying to the need of a new inward influence a new inward transformation which he describes as the father drawing otherwise he says no one will come to me no one will come into the kingdom no one will see the kingdom no one will enter it because faith in Christ is the way in it's a statement parallel to the statement Jesus made to Nicodemus well that's Jesus and his testimony to human inability is as clear as could be is it not now let me back that up quickly with Paul who also bears the same testimony to the natural state of the human race here we are in Romans chapter 8 where first of all you meet the cannot in verses 6 through 8 where Paul is talking about the natural state of the one whom the King James at any rate called the natural man and he says the mind of sinful man is death whereas the mind of controlled by the spirit is life and peace for the sinful mind is hostile to God it does not submit to God's law nor can it do so those controlled by the flesh cannot please God there's the cannot plain, clear, emphatic, unambiguous uh, until we are renewed renewed by God working in our hearts we cannot respond positively to anything God says to us cannot respond to his law in obedience the law says love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength as your neighbor as yourself we can't do that we can't even from our hearts want to do it the gospel says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and equally those who are in the grip of sin cannot do that either inability is the only word that fits it's a perverse inability but it's a real inability and it's not something we can change it's a guilty inability because our heart is in our rejection of God and his way but it's no less real an inability for that well that's Paul saying we cannot do what God calls us to do but then Paul has the answer to that and in fact we, it's, in, it's in this same 8th chapter and we read it uh, as our responsive reading this evening just glance on, glance on to verses 28 through 30 and let me show you one point about them it's in verse 30 those he predestined says Paul predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Christ that he might be the firstborn among many brothers those whom God predestined for this glorious this, this, this glorious new life he also called and, whom, and those whom he called he also justified that link shows that when Paul says he called what he means is not simply that he caused them to hear the invitation of the gospel with their outward ears but he also caused them to respond to it 
he changed their hearts in such a way that they received the invitation, they trusted the Savior, they came to faith. They saw, they entered the kingdom, they came to Christ. How do I know that? Well, because of the logic. Those he called, he also justified. Paul, in the first half of the letter, has beaten the drum about God justifying sinners through faith and justifying nobody apart from faith. Those whom he called, all of them he justified. Called then means those whom he means that he brought them to faith. And that actually is how Paul uses the verb call regularly in his letters. Uh, five minutes with a concordance will convince you of that if you haven't already seen it. Please turn the tape over now for the remainder of the message. Another example. First Corinthians chapter, <coughs> First Corinthians chapters one and two give you the same, uh, the same conjunction of thoughts. As in Romans eight, we read that God overcame human inability by calling. So we do in these chapters also. First Corinthians chapter two verse fourteen: inability. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Whenever you meet that word spiritually in the New Testament, the reference is to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean the human spirit as distinct from the human hands and feet. It has reference to the ministry of the Holy Spirit as distinct from anything that we can do when left to ourselves. And here is Paul saying that the man without the Spirit cannot understand the things of the Spirit, cannot understand the Gospel, cannot understand the grace of God bringing us, the grace of God holding before us the hope of glory and working to bring us to that glory. No, these things are spiritually discerned. If the unregenerate man is confronted by testimony to those things, he just gets bored and scoffs and walks away. Pie in the sky, poof, nonsense. So here is Paul once again testifying to human inability, intellectual inability. Romans 8 was inability to do, this is inability to know. But now you look back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, and you see Paul talking about the calling which overcomes human inability as it had worked out in the case of the Corinthian believers. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many influential, not many were of noble birth. God chose, yes, God called the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the weak things of the world to shame the strong, and so on. Think of your calling, brothers. It was through God's calling that you came to understand the gospel and your need of it. It was through God's calling that you came to actual response, actual faith in Jesus Christ the Savior. And how did it come about? Well, it came about because God changed your heart. That's how. So this is how the human problem of inability through sin is overcome by the grace of God. An inward work of renewal takes place, as Jesus explained to Nicodemus. And out of that comes seeing, where previously there was no understanding, at entry where previously there was no movement of response at all. And folk come into the kingdom by coming into a personal relation with the living Lord Jesus. And that leads us to the second thing of which I'm to speak and of which indeed I've been speaking and that's a good thing because my time is nearly gone. Some of the material from the second section got into the first section just because the exposition took me that way. But heading number two is the divine procedure, again, accord, according to Jesus and to Paul. And here I just want to add one thing to what I've said already, namely that we should understand that it's through the action of the Holy Spirit 
that the Father and the Son work to renew the human heart, to bring about what theologians call regeneration, and so to lead unbelievers into the reality of what the what the Bible itself calls new birth. It's a two-level work of God. There's the illuminating of the mind to understand, and there's the deeper level work that is the changing of the disposition of the heart, so that one comes to love what previously one disliked and to dislike what previously one loved. Previously, one loved the self-centered way of living and chose it. Now one falls out of love with the self-centered way of living, and what one wants to do is to choose Christ, choose God, choose life, choose worship, choose service, choose heaven, choose to glorify God, and enjoy him forever as the whole of one's destiny henceforth. Uh, it's as much choice when one chooses not to as it's choice when one chooses to. But when the heart is changed, you see, it's a different choice that's now being made. It's not a meritorious work. The Christian knows that. The scripture teaches the Christian that I did it, but I only did it because the Lord worked it in me. And the reformers expressed that, as I guess we all know, by their image of the empty hand outstretched to receive. And they talked about faith not as the meritorious cause of salvation, but the instrumental cause of salvation, simply the means of receiving. And by working at these two levels the level of giving understanding and the level of changing the heart in such a way as to produce a new choice, God the Holy Spirit, as the agent of the Father and the Son, calls sinners to faith. Thus, God draws men and women to Christ. Thus, it comes about that sinners are born again and enter the kingdom. Oh, there are plenty of other testimonies to it in the New Testament besides the ones that we've referred to, but here's just two or three more for samples. Paul in Second Timothy chapter two verses so, sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter two verses thirteen and fourteen. God be praised, he says, talking to the Thessalonians, we thank God for you, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief of, in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel. There it is, you see, there's the sequence. Um, he's talking to brothers loved by the Lord, as he says in verse 13. The expression of the Lord's love is that he chose these folk for salvation to be saved through the work of the Spirit, sanctifying them, and through the belief of the truth to which he called them through the gospel. That you might share, he says, end of verse 14, in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the plan of salvation. Same plan of salvation as in Romans 8, 28, 29, 30. Testimony, the testimony surely is very clear indeed. Or take Acts chapter 16, verse 14, where Luke is talking about the conversion of uh, Lydia. And he simply says, the Lord opened her heart. Uh, it's an aorist tense. It's a decisive divine action to which um, Luke is referring. He opened her heart so that she attended to the things spoken by Paul, or as the NIV expresses it, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. It was God's work. He moved her, and so she moved into faith. In the New Testament, it is made very plain that 
There are no spiritual responses without the new birth, and there is no new birth without spiritual response of the kind that you see in Lydia. We've already seen that there are no spiritual responses without new birth, and I need not say any more about that. But let me confirm the other side of the statement, the other, the, the complementary statement that there's no new birth without spiritual responses from things that are said in 1 John, where you remember the apostle is writing to a rump church. Uh, folk have withdrawn, saying, you lot who won't go a step beyond what the apostles taught you are very much in spiritual twilight. We are the people who've got the real understanding. We see things much more clearly than you do. We are tired of your stick-in-the-mud conservative conservatism. We are moving on, and they've gone. And the rump church is wondering whether, after all, the people who left were in the right. And, uh, oh, sorry, that wasn't intended to be a joke. I suppose it sounds rather funny using those words for it. They're wondering whether those who left were in the right and whether they who remained were in the wrong. And John writes to them to assure them that they are the people who are in the right. And that staying with the apostolic gospel was the proper thing for them to have done. And they are, in fact, says John, the ones who are born again. And the folk who've gone out for them are not pe persons who've been born again. And they're claimed to be men of faith and of the spirit and for, to know God is a phony claim and the proof of it is in their lives and so as part of his argument to reassure the true believers who are still faithful to the apostolic message and to show them what to think about the people who left them uh, John says things like this Chapter 5, verse 1 of First John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And again, chapter 3, verse 9. No one who's born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning as a course of life because he's been born of God. And this is how we know who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who doesn't do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who doesn't love his brother. No, love is one of the signs of new birth too. As he says in chapter 4, verse 7, everyone who loves, who loves his fellows, John means, has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love, by contrast, doesn't know God, etc., well, we haven't time to dwell on this. I only want to say that um, though as a reformed theologian I would like to uh, defend everything that my brother reformed theologians have said, I cannot defend the idea which some Dutch reformed and Dutch type reformed theologians embrace Namely, that there is such a thing as regeneration in infancy which doesn't show itself until years after. A little reflection on the teaching of 1 John would show, I think, that that is not a biblical way to think. Now, don't suppose that by saying this, I am uh, telling you that I'm preparing to become a Baptist. That's another question altogether. <laughs> But I am saying that I'm much embarrassed that uh, some of my pedo-baptist friends embrace this doctrine of latent infant regeneration, of which there isn't a word in Scripture, and which it seems to me one John plucks up at the roots. We have no right to suppose that anyone is born again unless the signs of a changed life in faith, in love, and in the righteousness which sets its face against habits of sin are apparent in that, in, in that person's life. Uh, uh, well, yes, though it's all in the text I quoted from 1 John a moment ago. But what I said is that we should be... Well, wait a minute, I can't repeat the sentence word for word. I can give you the thought, though. <coughs> the thought is that we should be quite clear that if a person is born again, a person is regenerate, uh, 
that person will show it by believing the apostolic faith, 1 John 5, 1, and loving, loving his brothers and the Lord's family, 1 John 4, 7, and practicing righteousness, um, John, 1 John 3, verse 10, and also 1 John 2, verse 29, and setting his face against any and every habit of continuing sin which would destroy the pattern of righteousness. Uh, 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Uh, that, that present tense, by the way, is correctly translated here by the NIV as pointing to continuance. Our English present tense doesn't do that in the clear way that the Greek present tense did. It's not he that is born of God will never sin even once. He, it's rather that he who is born of God will not continue in the way of sin um, as he did before. It's the same thought as at the beginning of Romans 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The answer is, God forbid, you can't do it. Don't you? How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Your nature has been changed. If you've really been born again, you can't continue in sin as you did before. Your heart revolts against, against the very idea. And if your heart doesn't revolt against the idea, that of course suggests that you're a phone. And there are pastoral implications in that which we can't pursue now. The born again person, like a newborn infant, this is following through the image of birth, will cry. That is to say, we'll pray. We shall cry to God as our Heavenly Father, and we shall want to pour out our hearts to Him, and that will be the first sign that we're born again. The newborn Christian infant then will cry. Uh, the newborn baby Christian, like any other newborn baby, will feed, will feel a hunger for the Word of God, and will love to take it in and masticate it and digest it and make it part of themselves says Peter in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, desire the true spiritual milk the milk of God's own teaching in the word that you may grow thereby. Well he's saying that to call into consciousness a desire which he knows is already in them as those who are born again but sometimes it's advisable to call desires which you know are there into active expression by saying something about them. It is natural however to the born again child of God to feed, to want to feed on the word. It's natural to the newborn child to move, the limbs move, the child wriggles, soon rolls, crawls and eventually walks. So too the newborn child of God will naturally and spontaneously want to move for God and do things for God. And again, it's a very bad sign. It suggests phoniness if that desire isn't apparent and the new pattern of activity for God isn't seen as establishing itself in that person's life. And finally, the newborn child in the human family will rest in mother's arms and the newborn child of God will rest in his father's, her father's love uh, whatever the pressures that are on from outside, so that you will see in the life of that person that inward peace which remains, even when the pressure is on and the strain is great. So those are the signs that a person is really born again. Uh, I garble them a little because I'm running over time now and I must close in a couple of minutes. But this is what I wanted to say about the divine procedure of bringing folk into new life through a change of heart, which produces faith and faith that expresses itself in this new way of living. You may want to cry out at this point, what about repentance? I'll talk about repentance tomorrow, friends, but I don't intend to raise the subject tonight. So thirdly, and very quickly, my last heading, we've looked at the human problem, in this matter of coming to faith, we've looked at the divine procedure as by which God brings us to faith. 
Now let's look at evangelistic practice. Again, according to Jesus and Paul specifically, they are the model for all Christian communicators, amongst whom you and I are also numbered. Learn from them how to communicate the gospel in light of their understanding of how it is that people come to faith. The formula is very simple. One, instruct. Two, invite. Three, intercede. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Jesus came preaching the gospel, giving instruction. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is near. That's gospel proclamation. Uh, Paul gave instruction. He speaks of that he speaks of that explicitly in Colossians chapter 1 verse 28 I'm sure you know the words he's very fulsome and comprehensive in the way that he puts it we proclaim Christ admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ we admonish and teach everyone with all wisdom instruction instruct was my first word invite the second word Jesus invited, having said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 15 ends by telling us that Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel, invitation. Matthew 11 also ends with invitation. Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That was his word to the world then, that's his word to the world still. And Paul also was a man who, having given instruction, moved to invitation. And evidently, from the way he talks about it, most passionate and emphatic invitation. Knowing, therefore, what the fear of the Lord means, we try to persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. God gave us the ministry of reconciliation, verse 18, and again verse 19. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, verse 20, as though God were making his appeal through us. And then, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Invitation. There's nothing in what I've said to discourage the giving of gospel invitations. There is everything to encourage the giving of such invitations for it's through the giving of such invitations that God works in men's hearts. So you instruct, and you invite, and you intercede. If it were not for the grace of God, there would be no Christian in the world, not now, not ever, and Jesus and the apostles knew that, and therefore... They are insistent that the word be backed with prayer. And Jesus prayed, as we know, and Paul prayed and begged others to pray with him. And do you remember how he expressed it in Second Thessalonians 3, verse 1? Finally, brethren, he says, pray, pray with me, pray for me, that the message of the Lord, the word of the Lord, may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you. Oh, what a G. June translation. What the Greek says is that the word of the Lord may run. That's vivid now. That the word of the Lord may run and triumph, just as it did among you, you Thessalonians, where you remember, says Paul, I ministered for less than three weeks and I, was, I, I saw the fruit and was able to leave a church behind me. Pray that the word will run and triumph. Uh, in other places as it did among you. Back the word with prayer. This, I think, is the point where many of us fall down. Uh, I put it to you that unless we talk to God about men in prayer, just as earnestly as we talk to men about God when we're preaching, we're not really understanding nor fulfilling our proper role as a ministry of the gospel, minister of the gospel. See, we can't convert anybody. We can't change hearts. Only the Lord can do it. Only the, <coughs> it's to the Lord, therefore, that we must look to do it. 
And if we preach and don't pray, well, then it looks for all the world as if our own deepest thought is that when folk come to faith, it will be our eloquence, our ability to teach and expound and convince that has produced the results. It will look, in other words, as if we are expecting that the glory for their conversion should go to us. We cannot expect God to honor us if that's the way we behave. So let us, now that we understand these things, make conscience of earnest prayer alongside our earnest preaching. And that will show that we've learned the lesson which Scripture teaches us for our guidance in the ministry concerning the source of faith. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we bow before you as those who, like Paul, have had the ministry of reconciliation committed to us and who are sent now to persuade our fellow men to beg them in Christ's name and on his behalf to be reconciled to you. We ask, Lord, that you will strengthen our hands and our hearts for this good work and that as we beg that you'll make us powerful preachers of the saving word, so we ask that you will make us powerful prayers for your blessing upon that word so that our ministry may reflect the understanding and have the shape and the strength that the ministry of those who understand these things that we've looked at tonight ought to have. So bless your word to our hearts and to our minds and to our judgments and shape our ministries right from this day on, we pray. And may we have the joy of seeing many brought to faith through our preaching and our praying. Grant us this, Lord, and all the glory shall be yours. None of it ours. All of it shall go where it should go. Hear us as thus we pray, and continue with us in this conference we beg. In Jesus' name, amen. Dr. Packer has agreed to spend a few minutes now answering questions, or trying to, that you might have. We won't stay long. We'll make sure that you get your shuttle and be on your way, but he can field the questions as well as I, so I'm just going to lay it open to you, and we'll take perhaps 15 or 20 minutes, and you raise your hand and make yourself heard by all. Uh, the question is... Um, where do regeneration and conversion come into Romans 8 verse 30 where Paul says uh, whom he called them he justified well regeneration and conversion are all contained in the single verb called that's the answer and that's why in that 17th century document which uh, is part of my Anglican heritage, namely the Westminster Confession. You as Baptists, of course, may not be very interested in that, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a superb statement of faith. It was produced by Anglicans, and it's been claimed by Presbyterians, but uh, I, as an Anglican, am claiming it back, you see. Um, in the Westminster Confession, there isn't a chapter on conversion. There isn't a chapter on regeneration, but it's all expressed in the... Uh, chapter on effectual calling uh, by a happy accident or was it an accident I brought the Westminster <laughs> Confession with me just in case <laughs> and would like to read you the first paragraph of chapter 10 of effectual calling all those whom God has predestinated unto life says the confession echoing Romans 8 he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them a heart of flesh 
renewing their wills, and by his almighty power determining them to what is good, and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. Yet so, that means in such a way, as that they come most freely being made willing by his grace. See, it's all there. Um, as far as the precise definition of terms is concerned, um, conversion means turning to God. I haven't talked yet about repentance, which I hope to do tomorrow. Repentance I would take as part of the definition of conversion. But then the re repentance itself, as I shall be trying to say, is the fruit of faith. God calling a person to the, that is bringing a person to the point where he or she actively and consciously believes is the very core of the, 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 the fundamental dimension, shall I say, of turning to God. And uh, as for the word regeneration, you may have noticed I didn't. Actually, I deliberately didn't use it as a technical term. I find that uh, that often confuses because in the New Testament, the language of, at least it seems to me as, as an exegete now, that the language of new birth and new begetting is not used with the sort of precision with which the words faith and grace and justify, Paul's verb, uh, are used. In other words, they, they're, they're much more terms of illustration than they are technical terms to be used for the defining of doctrine. And so I try to say all the things that I've said without using the word regeneration as one of my technical terms. In that, I'm doing something which the theology textbooks, uh, or rather, I'm, I'm declining to do something which the theology textbooks are in the habit of doing. And I may be unwise, but at the moment, it seems to me better that our technical terms in our systematic theology correspond to the technical terms of Scripture and where a scripture term isn't a technical one, I would rather not make it into a technical term for our use. Otherwise, people are going to have exegetical problems, as has actually happened over regeneration. You know, people uh, thinking in terms of a moment of regeneration and then asking how that relates to the coming of faith. Well, I don't think that the question can be very clearly answered when it's asked, and I would rather talk about God's calling, that's Paul's technical term, God's calling as a single um, complex operation involving the coming of the word through the ears into the mind, the coming of the spirit into the mind to give understanding, the coming of the spirit into the heart, that's the core of the personality as we all know, to change the basic disposition of the heart so that now you are made willing and indeed made desirous to embrace the new life in Christ and get away from the old life of sin. And then the Spirit calls that uh, desire into action and you do believe and thus you are called. It's a complex operation. But I find it more convenient in explaining these things to stay with Paul's concept. And that, that's what I was doing actually in my talk. Uh, no, sir, you're second. This gentleman in red is first. <clears throat> I wonder if you might expand on your Again, for the sake of the microphone, I'm going to repeat what I take to be the essence of the question. I'm asked to expand what I said about invitation in light of the questioner's uncertainty and hesitation in giving invitations. Um, and he spoke about... Uh, his reason, he spoke of his reason as being that, the gospel, that coming to Christ is a spiritual thing rather than a physical act. From his saying that, I infer that for him the phrase uh, inviting or giving an invitation means what it does mean actually in the Baptist world generally, that you ask people to make some physical gesture of uh, commitment to Christ. You come out and kneel at the at the. Uh, altar rail at the front or something like that. Well, in, le let me say, <clears throat> when I spoke of uh, inviting people to Christ, I wasn't thinking of uh, calling them to make any immediate physical response at all. I think that there's more to be said against calling for immediate physical acts of response 
than there is to be said in favor of it. You may have a different view, but that's mine. Uh, it's a pros and cons business. I don't think that you can say that all the spiritual arguments are against doing it. There are considerations in favor as well as considerations on the other side. But when one is preaching regularly to the same congregation, I think the arguments against um, doing it are more compelling than the arguments for doing it. So let me make quite clear uh, that when I said invite, I was simply meaning deliver verbally the invitation which Christ issues. But now, having said that, uh, let me say further that I take my cue in this matter from the parable of the Great Supper, where all things had been made ready and the invitation went out, come to the, come to the supper. And the only reason why folk didn't get the benefit of this wonderful meal that had been prepared for them was that they made excuse and weren't willing to come. And by parity of reasoning, I now argue that in the ministry of the gospel, the invitation which is given, delivered in Christ's name to everyone who hears is a bona fide invitation. Uh, the questioner said that he was a Calvinist. Well, that was good hearing because, you see, so am I. But um, <coughs> I, I, another thing in the Reformed tradition which embarrasses me is that so many Calvinists, and it really is the majority, have settled for a rationale of these comprehensive invitations which stop short at saying, we don't know who the elect are, we can't pick them out to invite them personally, so we issue invitations generally and leave it to the Holy Spirit to pick the elect out. It seems to me that that's uh, inadequate as a warrant for the universal invitation because that doesn't go so far as saying that the invitation is a bona fide summons to a savior who would save you if you came to him. Um, and that needs to be said. Christ really is there saying, you come to me. And at the, if you think forward to the day of judgment, quite certainly all who heard the gospel and said no will have their mouths stopped. They won't be able to say, well, it was all a plant. God, as far as I was concerned, I was never one of your elect. You never had any mercy for me. The invitation was a phony. I would have been a goon to try and respond to it. But nothing like that can be said. Uh, so when I'm talking about the atonement, as a reformed man, I always uh, formulate my view like this. The first effect of the cro first achievement of the cross was to undergird the offer of salvation in Christ as a bona fide offer to everyone who hears it. Christ is there. The Christ of Calvary is there. Um, to receive any, every, uh, everyone who is invited to come to him. Although, in, in, in fact, they don't come, but that's not because there wasn't mercy there for them. They rejected it. Then further, I say, the, 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 the further effect of the cross was to guarantee the effectual calling and final salvation of all those whom specifically the Father gave to the Son to save. That's how I express particular redemption within that wider context. And I conceive that in saying it that way, I am catching, the, I'm catching in my statement the thrust of every single New Testament statement about the cross that is made. So I offer that to you. Try it on for size. See if you find yourselves uh, believing what I have come to believe. It isn't quite the um, conventional reformed way of speaking, but I think it's biblically, it's biblically um, proper and indeed biblically obligatory to say to say that say that much. Now, in light of that view of the cross, I think it right for us to do as George Whitfield and Charles Spurgeon before us used to do, and really make a big thing of pressing the invitation. Not pressing it in the manner of an evangelist impersonating the Holy Spirit. Ch 
Charles Finney started that, and uh, evangelists ever since Finney have been uh, carrying it on. You know, you know the the, um, the jargon. I now give you an opportunity to respond to God. When you think that's an appalling thing for a man to say, he is not the Holy Spirit, he is not the Lord Jesus. I give you an opportunity. Such nonsense. But um, what I'm talking about is the kind of I would once say it the kind of pleading of uh, man's need and Christ's mercy which is calculated not to draw out of your hearers a response to you the preacher but a response to him the saviour and the angle of your application ought always to be pointing to him the Christ whom you so badly need and who so graciously offers himself to you. Uh, George Whitfield, um, as I can prove from historical data, would spend up to half an hour at a time doing this after he'd spent the three quarters of an hour or a full hour expounding, uh, expounding the doctrine of his sermon. Then you would get a real heavyweight application. He refers to it in his own uh, writings about his ministry and there are three transcribed sermons which exhibit it so one knows exactly what he did well there was nothing wrong with that other way round that was absolutely right and uh, the fact that he spent his strength in pointing people to Christ in this way um, was surely directly linked with the fact that as John Wesley said in Whitfield's memorial sermon no one in our time has been used anything like so much in bringing sinners to faith in Christ. Well, I'll leave it to you to make the application, but that's my mind about invitations. The question is, how do I explain moral inability in such a way as to convince people that they are accountable for the things that they do and uh, cannot shift the blame or get out from under their guilt. Uh, I try to make that point by hammering away at the fact that we like our sins, we like to keep God at arm's length, we like our self-indulgence, and things that are wrong uh, become uh, I'm, I'm sorry, say this. Say that. Let me let me back, t- pull those words back and make my point in a different in different terms. Um, the fact that we like the wrong things we do, uh, and that therefore we are choosing to indulge ourselves in doing what we know to be wrong when we do these wrong things, uh, it's that that makes us guilty for having done it. Parallel case. It is no defence if a kleptomaniac or let's make it more poignant, a child abuser uh, says in court, but you ought not to condemn me for the things that I've done because I made that way. It's my nature to abuse children or to steal from shops or whatever it is. You ought to understand that and uh, see it as sufficient reason for letting me go. Well, in a court of law, you know what the answer to that one would be. If anything, that kind of barefaced uh, uh, barefaced protest increases the guilt rather than diminishes it remember ever since the garden of Eden the sinner has been trying to shift the blame for his or her sin it's one of the uh, syndromes of our fallen human nature shift the blame at all costs and this I think is another place where we try to do it But if you can hold people to the thought that they know it's wrong and yet they uh, like doing it and they continue to do it although they know it's wrong and they don't even try not to do it, uh, which is the story when people simply shake their head at the preaching of the gospel and say, no, I'm not going to turn to God. I don't want to do that. Um, Then... It will take conviction from the Holy Spirit as well. But you are saying something which rationally, when when the Spirit begins to work in their consciences, will make plain, I think, their accountability to them. At least that's the best I can do. Um, 
and it's, it's, it's got scripture precedent, that approach. Um, sinners are censured in scripture because they love unrighteousness. Thank you for listening to this message from Desiring God, the ministry of John Piper, pastor for preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message for others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit Desiring God online at www. Dot desiringgod.org, where you'll find hundreds of sermons, articles, radio broadcasts, and more, all available to you at no charge. Our online bookstore carries all of Pastor John's books, audio, and video resources, and you can also stay up to date on what's new at Desiring God. Again, our website is www.desiringgod.org, or call us toll-free at one 888 346-4700. Our mailing address is Desiring God, 2601 East Franklin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55406. Desiring God exists to help you make God your treasure because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.